Okay, well, one, uh, before I start with the um, presentation, I'll give a few words about mobile life. For those of you who don't, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, I'll give a few words about Mobilize. So, uh, Mobilize is a company um, that has been busy in solving accidents and improving driving safety um, for the last one, four years. In recent years, we're expanding our, our products, our technologies to offer new ways of improving safety and to uh, offer advanced drug functions and, and uh, highly automated driving. Um, in that, we, we are, have a lot of development activities that correlate with these, uh, with, the, with these fields, and here we're going to highlight the, the mapping activity. So before we talk about crowdsource mapping and our approach to crowdsource mapping, I'll start with explaining in a very intuitive way uh, why we think mapping is necessary. So the examples, the example I have in my mind is, is driving in a place um, you're, regu you're driving regularly in, like, you, you know, like your daily commute. Um, so when you drive from home to work, you're probably much more uh, familiar with the road, you have a lot of confidence, you can anticipate in advance what's coming, so you're much less li likely to do something dangerous. Um, on the other hand, once you're driving in a new place you've never been before, like, drive, like landing in India, taking a car from the airport, trying to drive to your hotel at night, you're probably much more likely to do something dangerous because you don't even understand the rules of the game, right? Yeah. So that, that pre-existing memory that we have is very useful for us when we are driving. And it, it is uh, very important for us to understand properly, to conceive, the driving rules, the driving structure of the road, the uh, do's and don'ts for each and every road in order to drive safely and comfortably everywhere. So what we aim to achieve is the exact same um, tool through, through mapping. So the motivation behind the high resolution mapping is eventually safe and comfortable driving experience relies on a correct and consistent understanding of a lot of different features and attributes of the road. It starts with drivable path and lane marks, road edges, crosswalks position, and many, many, many different features that are all a part of the road you're driving in. However, achieving this interpretation in a consistent way, in a reliable way, in an accurate way, everywhere on the planet is not an easy task to do. There is a lot of different variation between uh, geographies, between cities even within the same country, and different conventions on how traffic lights, for example, are, um, are positioned, where they are positioned, how they are um, uh, associated to driving lanes, and so on. And understanding this through online sensors alone is a very complicated task that will require a lot of investment and will probably make the entire system more expensive and also less robust. And this is kind of the premise from which all the all method activities that we are aware of um, start. So, um, the common approach today to build high definition maps, which are maps that has um, a lot of features in, in, in high resolution, which means centimeter level accuracy and lane level information, is to build a survey fleet that has a lot of different sensors. These are high end sensors like LIDARs and uh, nearest navigation systems and so on. And then you build this fleet that is uh, relatively expensive and you operate this fleet in areas you want to map. So, for example, you want to create a map in Detroit, you will send a few hundreds or thousands of cars, drive the streets, and then this is your way to operate. Afterwards, normally comes a semi-automatic process to kind of process all the raw data that you collect, and you have a high-definition map. The problem with this approach is that it is very, very hard to scale this to cover useful areas. So when you think about products that will eventually be useful for end users, you need to be able to cover pretty much all roads on the planet, right? Or at least in the United States if you're here, or in Europe if you're in Europe. And you need to also, um, you know, driving here in Detroit is very, is very obvious. I come from Israel, which is even worse, but construction zones is, are a real issue. And roads are fre frequently changing, and you always have, sorry if you lost the presentation, and you always have changes. So without an inherent capability to update the maps and keep them fresh, the product itself will maybe be useful at day one, but as time goes by, it will start to deteriorate. Right? So there needs to be some kind of a scale that we can achieve through the technology itself that we use. So our approach leverages uh, mobilized strength. So one of the strengths that we have is the fact that we have been delivering 
safety products in the automotive industry for two decades now. So again, for those of you who don't know, we are maybe the, the strongest business today is front cameras. Front cameras on the windshield that provides a forward collision warning, uh, lane, uh, legal speed uh, assist, and cruise control, lane keep assist, uh, lane departure warning, all these applications that are today um, very common are technologies that we have delivered. In 2022, now we have delivered more than 33 million uh, products, million chips, which means 33 million cars driving everywhere on the planet with mobile products inside. And these products are smart cameras that can detect everything you can see on the road. So traffic signs and road markings and crosswalks, traffic type, everything is observed and detected by the camera. And it is being used for safety purposes. Our idea was to leverage this capability and to simply upload data from these systems to a cloud. It's like uploading a lot of pieces of a puzzle to a cloud, in which we will build this puzzle in a very efficient and automatic process. In this way, you can think of it as kind of a continuously uh, building a puzzle from new pieces all the time. And then when you get a new piece, you can understand if this piece is replacing an existing piece for a specific growth or something changed. So this is a very efficient way to cover a lot of areas and also keep the map up to date. So basically, the, uh, the, the process is, very, is relatively straightforward. Cars are, are kind of driving and um, detecting different features like traffic signs and crosswalks and, and so on. This data is uploaded to a cloud. In this cloud, we are assembling this map from all these pieces automatically. And then we have a, one big database for all the roads on the planet from all the information we got from all the cars, and this database can be used by cars for whatever feature we want to, to offer. It could be uh, autonomous driving, and it can be enhanced uh, driver assist type of features, which I will expand in a minute. Um, so to, to give you some idea on how it looks like, in order for this to be an actual product that can meet the, the market and not just a, uh, a research program, it needs to comply with certain constraints. So first of all, it needs to be cost efficient, so the data needs to be slim. But also, there are a lot of privacy and, and data privacy specific regulation in Europe and other places in the world that you must comply with. So, in order to, to be fully compliant and to make it a, a very efficient process, the data we are using is very, very sparse. So, what you will see here on the left in this uh, black uh, uh, square is a visualization of the, the information we're offering. Okay, so you see these are like squares and lines and you know dots. It's not easy to understand what's going on here. So we're not uploading video streams or images to our cloud. It is just kind of the, the outputs of all of our computer vision algorithms that run on the chip. So it's very hard for us to know here, you know, where are the, the people and to see faces and to see license plate. These are not included in the information we're uploading, so it's fully anonymized. And of course, then it makes our lives harder when we want to build the map later on, um, because eventually we need to get to this outcome on the right side, which is a very, very precise map, nitty gritty, looks uh, excellent with all the features and high accuracy. So the way we do that is, and I'll take you through some of the steps, um, I promise it's not too technical, um, is there is a very, very complicated problem that needs to be solved in when you're working with crowd data. Because an inherent uh, attribute is that you're not controlling how people are driving. So people could be driving however they want, sometimes against the rules. And sometimes, somehow this technology needs to understand which uh, driving pattern is desirable, which is not desirable. Sometimes sort out or filter out the unwanted uh, data pieces and leave, leave in only the ones we want. But it's not an easy thing to do because you know the, the reality is ambiguous. So when you start, the, the first task you have is to understand where to position each and every data piece that you get. So you get in the cloud a data piece that says there is a traffic sign in this position, okay, in I-96 in the United States. First of all, we need to understand where it came from, right? So we will look at the GPS uh, information. It's kind of a rough guess. Problem is GPS is not in very accurate measurements. So of course, if you, uh, that's a common problem in mapping. Um, you can see the big, these kind of uh, fat sleeves 
are GPS tracks from cars that drove in the same place. So you see how inaccurate it is. It's very hard to understand if a certain car drove in the rightmost lane, leftmost lane, center lane. It didn't take the right turn or continued straight. And it makes it very, very complicated to sort out and, and properly align the data pieces in, its, in their right position. So we have uh, developed over the years an algorithm that, that aligns all this data using all the information we get, which then creates this image, which again, it's, it's a little bit hard to, to identify, but already it looks a little bit more like a road. Right? You can, even without understanding, uh, without coming from mobile, you can understand intuitively what you're seeing. You can see that there are maybe some lanes here divided by these purple points, right? And you see these red points are maybe like where people drove. So that is, that is exactly what it is. So already, just with uh, aligning data according to common observation of the same objects and doing this repetitively using multiple objects, you can uh, reach a very accurate description of how the world looks like. And then there is a series of, of kind of modeling the noise and mod modeling the, the observation uh, that we get and creating something a little bit more neat, like this image. What you can see here is kind of an output after we have modeled the, the point clouds we got from multiple uh, drives from the same road and created it in a, in a very efficient and, uh, and accurate way. So you see that, for example, the purple point clouds we saw earlier, the divided lanes, are now modeled as these green lines. Okay, so it's, a, it's not a point cloud, it's a line. So it's, it's supposed to be positioned exactly where it should be. The same goes for these purple uh, uh, polygons. These are crosswalks. So instead of having like a point cloud that is not accurate, we create kind of a more, more fine and, uh, and uh, sharp representation of all the uh, static objects. But again, this is not useful yet, because this is just a static um, description of where things are positioned. When you think about higher levels of uh, driving functions, the system needs to understand how to react to each and every feature. There is a certain meaning behind features. So it's not enough to know that there is a traffic, la traffic light here. I don't know if you can see the last one. This. Here, in the center of this junction, there is a traffic light. It is not enough to know that there is simply a traffic light at this position, because when a car will approach this junction, the system will need to decide, should you react to it if it's red or green, right? Should it continue driving or should you stop? And this information needs to be provided in a way. So after we have this static image, we start with a series of we call this semantic features, which provide the meaning for each and every feature in a way that uh, um, systems can understand. So the first one is, is what we call drumroll path. You see these yellow spines are where people are driving. And this is after we've modeled and sorted out all the undesired behaviors and so on. You get these yellow lines, which are like rails of trains. So now think of this as that every place that people used to drive, in the data that I gets, we can create a rail that an autonomous vehicle can follow. So even if you don't have observable lane marks, for example, even if this road structure is not clear, you can still drive, which is according to how people are driving there. Yes, that is a very, very useful uh, piece of information. Then based on that, we assign and associate uh, features to these lanes. So for example, I'm zooming here, you will see that this traffic light that I mentioned, you can see these red lines connecting it to specific drivable paths, which now means if you're driving on these three drivable path, when you will approach this traffic light, you will know it's relevant to the lane you're in. If you're driving on those two, uh, two ones, it's not relevant to you. So now when you approach a junction, you know in advance which traffic light I should look at to monitor the color, and which is not relevant. So again, this is a very, very important feature. Without it, you can hardly imagine any type of uh, autonomous vehicle operates in junctions. And there are many, many features like this that we have for traffic signs, like yield signs, and stop signs, legal speed signs, and so on. In addition to those, well, these are features that are more kind of uh, explicit features of how the road is, is constructed. We also extract and, and, and benefit from the fact that we are using actual crowd to learn how people are driving, like natural behavior of, of uh, human drivers. And one, one example of this is driving speed. 
So it's not enough to understand the legal driving speed in a specific road. Again, coming from Israel, if you would be driving according to the legal speed, you will be a robot that everyone will honk at you and you know, scream at you at the junction and so on. It's very common in, in Israel to drive 20 or 30 kilometers per hour above the legal speed everywhere. Okay? So again, it's not that the autonomous vehicle needs to be driving like this uh, by design, but understanding this is very, very important. If you want to anticipate what others are going to do, if you want to, to anticipate the expected velocity of it, that a car will enter a junction, it's not about measurements, it's also about history, right? So having all this history and all this knowledge of how hundreds and thousands of different people drove in this road at a long period of time allows us to have kind of a superpower uh, for, for the system that will use this, uh, this map. So this is, uh, in, in, uh, in five minutes, a little bit about the technology and what it provides. But now the question is, how, how well does it scale? Right? So we have just emphasized a specific junction in a specific place. It's easier to show it in one, in one place. So the benefit of, uh, of uh, our crowd is, is that we can take this technology and then scale it globally relatively easily because, again, the coverage we have working with dozens of OEMs from all the different markets in the world for a long period of time allows us to kind of scale immediately. So what you see here, this is a, a uh, kind of an overview of the coverage we have in RAM globally. And you see the, the coverage in Europe, United States, Australia, Japan, India, China is not mentioned here because of regulatory issues. We cannot show here data from China. It's only available in China. Um, but we also have coverage in China. So if you look at it, um, at the impact and the strength of crowdsourcing, look at Europe and how the coverage is scaling. This is just within one day. Okay, This is after one week. So the, the time it takes to create coverage is very, very uh, short, relatively. Because again, it is crowdsourced. These are regular people driving their, their car, uploading data uh, to a cloud. So thinking about how much time it takes us to, under, to get a new data piece from a specific road, we're talking about minutes in highways, or hours in, in urban streets. So maintaining a, a fresh map is, is a different story when you have the benefit of uh, crowdsourcing. Um, of course, we're in the United States, so it doesn't make sense just to show Europe. Um, but this is, again, the United States after one day, after one week, and after two weeks, and so on. So you see the coverage is, is growing uh, exponentially as time uh, goes on. <clears throat> so these blue points that, I, that, you sh that you see as coverage, each and every one of those, if you zoom in, okay, you will zoom in, you will see the same level of detail that we have just presented in a small scale in one junction. And again, imagine the same exercise we've just uh, um, viewed in one specific area. This is performed all over the map in all the blue points that you've just uh, seen. So I think that the obvious question now is what do you do with it? What, what good does it serve? Right? So we, we see two, primary, two, two main channels to leverage this database in an in impactful way. And this is an important uh, statement to make. Um, in our company, everything we do, we start with the end user experience and we move our way backwards. And we, it's not just about developing technologies, it's about really understanding how it can impact and change the way um, people are driving and the safety that we can offer um, and the driving experience. So there are two ways in which we, we, uh, we think we can deliver impact using this uh, technology. One is what we call cloud-enhanced driver assist which means that the standard driver assist the functions that are prevalent today, like ACC, uh, cruise control, lane keep assist, any departure warning, lane centering, all these applications that every car today has um, can be much improved using this technology. Okay, so again, taking the example of how do you know where the car needs to be positioned if you don't see the lane marks. So every one of you who have an experience driving with lane centering or lane keep assist, the moment you start, you stop seeing the lane marks, it, it simply will not work, right? So now we can take it from 80% like coverage to 100% coverage of the function using this database. Um, in addition, we can offer this uh, traffic lights, um, I'm sorry, uh, the traffic lights uh, information I, uh, I reviewed can also be offered as a safety feature in ADAS, driver assist. So today, 
there are hardly or any solutions for red light crossing. You cannot think of a, of a car that offers a safety solution for red light, red light uh, crossing, like a, you know, emergency braking or alerting when you are about to enter a, ju a junction in a, red, in a red light. Reason being, it's not a trivial problem to solve using existing sensors because understanding which traffic light is relevant to the lane you're in is a complicated problem. Now, having this database in the cloud allows us to solve this problem by simply connecting the, the system today to a cloud, okay, which makes it more robust and, and with coverage everywhere. And now you can think of offering to drivers a function that will alert you before or if you are about to enter a junction in a, in a red light. Um, so this is one area that we think will, will redefine what it means, standard driver assist functions. Because today, all, the, all of these entry-level systems are standalone sensor sets with a compute unit. Um, and if you think about our smart smartwatches and, and cell phones, a lot of the breakthroughs came through cloud connectivity. And now when we have a smart database in the cloud, we can simply by accessing this database, we can enhance the experience without adding expensive sensors, without adding the cost of the, a lot to the cost of the system. So when you think of tens of millions of cars, this is very, very attainable in terms of the, the um, added investment. So that is one area in which we see a lot of potential. Already we have uh, several OEMs that we've announced working with this technology, leveraging it to, to their uh, um, uh, driving functions for, for ADAS and so on. The second area is for highly automated driving, eyes off, hands off uh, driving uh, functions. This is kind of our product portfolio in terms of the different spectrum. So, so far we've just covered the what we call eyes on, hands on. So again, the driver is still driving all the time. Eyes on the road, hands on the wheel. And we can enhance the experience and safety using this database. This is the leftmost uh, column here. The, from that, there is a series of products that we are developing and working with OEMs to, to launch that offers first eyes on, hands off. And then eventually, eyes off, hands off. Okay, so eyes on, hands on, and then eyes off, hands off. Which means, eyes on, hands off is like an autopilot function. You can take your hands off the wheel, but you're still need, you still need to be engaged as a driver. And eyes off, hands off is you can do whatever you want, in a way, okay, up to a certain limit. Um, now, it's important to say that uh, RAM crowdsource mapping is kind of the foundation on which all of these products are built. So. The difference between these systems are the, the sensor sets and the amount of compute we have. These are the differences. RAM is providing the same level of information, the complete understanding of the environment, the road, and everything around it, for all these different product lines. And when you take a, a car that only has a front camera, and you add multiple cameras around the car, you can offer hands-free driving. And then when you, once, you, once you also add LIDARs or radars, you can offer eyes off driving. But again, the basis again, on which all of these products are built is RAM. So in our vision, we, we see that within the next few years, a lot of, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of the vehicles in the world will be connected to this database. Some of those will use it just to enhance the safety and driving experience for regular ADAS, eyes on, hands on systems. Some will use it for hands-off, and some will use it for eyes-off. But this is kind of an ecosystem that all of these systems, for whatever purpose, will benefit from, and will contribute data to, and will receive the map in return. Right? And this will be kind of an evolving uh, story that will continue to improve over time. Um, I, I think I'll stop here, because we're out of time. I'm going to like two, two minutes for questions, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question. I have a car that is three years old. Three years old. driving around Boston. Uh, and then we took a trip to New York City. And much to my surprise, I had no clue. The dashboard started showing traffic signals ahead, mm -hmm. the state of the traffic signal, and how, far, how fast I should drive to maximize hitting green lights. Where the heck did that come from? <laughs> I, so, yeah. So I'm not sure exactly which feature you refer to, but in general, um, there are a lot of maps today in the world that offer different types of features, including legal speed limits and, uh, and the traffic light position and so on. The difference is coverage, 
the reliability of these features and the richness of the features you can you can offer. Okay, so um, and I should say another thing: the lead level information is critical in specific use cases. If you're driving straight on a highway, it's relatively easy to to see. You know, if you hear me, not, but, uh, but if you're driving straight on a the highway, there's a traffic sign on the side that says uh, 70 mph is the real speed limit. Then it's relatively easy to map this entire road and say this is a 70 mph road and put it in the map, and then you can have it in your car, even if this, the, the camera cannot see it and you cannot see it. The question becomes, uh, uh, the, the task becomes more difficult when you have an, an interchange. Now suddenly the rightmost lane is 70 mph or 50 mph, and the leftmost lane is a different story. You have junctions, you have round roads, you have different use cases in which the resolution is higher. You need to be the level of details is higher, so you need to be more uh, accurate and you need to be uh, more robust. And of course, in the geographic scale and coverage is also a different story. I know this function is often very yeah, you know, I'm wondering if, if the function is in the car somehow particularized because there's no, no, no. Or no. I don't know for sure. I shouldn't say no. I don't think so. Um, I think it's a, it's a map or a, a sensor that can detect it. Yeah. Question for the use case of uh, me uh, entering Detroit mm -hmm. from the airport and I need to go to Grand River Avenue in Novi. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask my hands off, uh, eyes off vehicle to bring me there or do I need uh, an additional map or is that information also in your map? No, this is a standalone stand um, product. And one of the benefits that we, so we don't need another map. And one of the benefits we have, or the, the design guidelines that we had, is that this uh, database can also be merged with whatever map you want. So it can stand, it can provide this information on its own, on its own but we can also integrate this with other navigation maps, other uh, weather maps, whatever it may be, um, and fuse this into one database, and then you can have uh, the best of both things. But even without it, it's, it's capable of providing this. Yeah, honest question? Um, is it present how the data camera can map the road? Do you trust other people's cameras, uh, cars, or whatever? Uh, you know, hiding the area uh, and the local has been mapping the roads for eight years. Do you trust to make that into the system? Yeah, so the, the data that we're using for this map is, using, is, is coming only from mobile cameras, so only from the software that we're deploying on mobile cameras. Uh, I'm not saying that we're not trusting anyone else. This is the situation as it is today. We don't see a need to add more data sources. Okay. Right. Maybe. Yeah. Can you talk about the how the packet is not sent and then base what's the different model to construct some with it? You asked about the commercial structure behind this. That's a, good, uh, that's a good question, and uh, I'll try to answer it briefly because it's a broad topic. The, the um, general idea is that, again, we're creating an ecosystem. So there is an, an incentive for OEMs to contribute data, and OEMs who are contributing data, for example, Volkswagen or Ford or whoever it may be, can um, use the data for their purposes if they want this data. But also, they will get good conditions in licensing the database for improving functions. <coughs> Okay, so the more you contribute data, the more you can, so to speak, discount how much you will need to pay to get this data. Okay? And this, is, this creates kind of a win-win situation because OEMs eventually want the best-in-class functions at a good price point. And OEMs that have the fleets can offer the fleet as an advantage and get a very advanced function at a good price point. 